Hey guys, how's it going? Oh, I'm so glad you liked it yesterday. That was a lot of fun to learn about. And show off all the guidelines and things that y'all should know about Intigmatary. Travis is on fire trying to do everything he's not supposed to be doing. I just spilled tea on the desk, but now it's all clean. At least the desk got cleaned up. <laughs> At least it's good and washed. How's everybody doing? Yesterday's live was wonderful. That was really fun. Well, it was a workshop. You're feeling more confident? Yay. Good job. Good job. Let's make some new notes. Have y'all got anything down on your um, beginning of radiology here? I was, that's my next section to update. So I thought we could start off with writing some notes down about what is going on with our endocrine system. And I know a couple of people have asked about the endocrine system and I don't know why they pushed this picture all the way back in the back of radiology but they do when we have an endocrine picture well we have endocrine codes at the end of the male or the female genitalia one of those two has the endocrine CPT codes I don't know why they don't just put this picture there anyway I know that I don't know why they don't do a lot of things in this book, if they had me writing it, it'd be look, looking a whole lot different anyway. So let's see. What does our hypothalamus do? It regulates our what? Anybody know? It regulates everything that is wrong with me, that's for sure. So our hypothalamus regulates our hunger, thirst, temperature, uh, and our wakefulness. So that's what I would write down beside it. Our thymus, thymus, thymus. It helps build. 
resistance to diseases. Our adrenal glands are important for your metabolic process and your fright and flight things. Get your adrenaline going. Also our cortisone levels, cortisone and our adrenaline. You're taking the CCS soon. Same thing um, that we do um, for our CPC exam. You need to practice um, coding E and M without a <clears throat> MDM without a time. How would you diagnose things with just a diagnosis, or just how many systems they reviewed, how many body organs they removed, reviewed? How would you? code an E and M situation like that. You also need to get really good at long cases for the end of yours because your cases are not multiple choice, I don't think. Um, where you can just look at the preoperative, postoperative diagnoses, then your pre-op um, descriptor of what procedure is getting done, and then Check your bottom of your note to make sure they didn't stop the procedure, add another procedure, and that everything progressed fine, and then code it um, as you're supposed to code it without too much help. I think y'all have fill in the blanks. You have the answers to the side, but they're not like A, B, C, or D, but it's like you get to pick from a sorted um list and match them with the cases that they go to. So getting getting fast at the practice questions that y'all have. You need a little bit more for CCS payment methodology. So um, I would definitely make sure you know or write in, especially your four pages in the back that are for just notes some of your payment methodology that you could write out in these areas um, so you don't have to memorize it all. That would be nice. These influence Influence how believe it or not, how your blood circulates. Mental vigor, funny word. And no worries. 
The rest of it is just like what we do. You need to practice um, or at least get your CPT codes to where you have one word differences between them so that you can tell right away what you're doing. Um, that's super important, especially when codes are starting out with the same words. Um, let's see, do we have anything in radiology that would be like that right off the top of my head? These two. Right here, this 50 and 55, they're both parent codes. They both start out with the same word. Looks like one is retrograde, one is voiding. Then they say everything else the same. So your one word differences, sorry about the shine. Right here for 74450, I would write retrograde and then I would write voiding right here. That way, you don't have to evaluate these CPT code descriptors during the middle of your exam. You've already done that work ahead of time and written the one word differences. They both include supervision and interpretation. So S and I, I would put there underneath them so you don't have to worry about that. But anything that has two parents with the same beginning thing, absolutely. It's going to be harder to decide what the difference is if they pick those two. On the other side, we've got endoscopic, endoscopic. They start in the same catheterization, catheterization of the binary ductal system, and this one's of the pancreatic. So this is bilinary, bilaruby, bila, bila, whatever. And this is pancreatic. So those are the two differences. Just write them over there. Even just underlining them makes you tend to want to read the whole sentence till you get to the underlined word. It slows you down in your exam. If you know that you can just grab the one word that's right underneath that CPT code, which would be Billy, and then this one would be Pancreat, you've, you can just grab those two words, search your question, and pick out which one they're doing. It's a lot easier and keeps you from wasting time. I wonder if the process of elimination works with y'all's exam. I should go take the C CCS. Although they don't have it, I don't think they do it online. It would be really nice to be able to take that exam online and just see how y'all's exam differs from the CBC. One of these days when I slow down, have some free time, I'll take y'all's exam too, just to see what it, what's different so that I could better advise you too. Oh yeah, energy, energy, energy. Our thyroid. So all I'm doing is just Googling endocrine system with function so that I can just look up what the function of all these are. And then you pair them up and write it out in your own words, whatever you want to write, so that just in case they ask you anything about any of these parts, you'll know what they do for each of them. Don't know which five questions they're going to pick that they could ask you. And I just look at several variations, make sure that they're all saying the same consistent thing. And plus it's what I've learned in my years of being in the medical field since, oh, well, I did school. So, but since the late nineties and just try to write it all down. I remember taking A and P one and two, and we had to dissect these cats, and they were like humongous cats. They were as big as a seven foot table. They were long cats, and and you know I've got cats, and it was very traumatic. But looking at what some of these parts are inside the body, and then having to put a flag in them was really hard. Um, 
But I remember coming in and the doc and the teacher would just give you a list and and give you a list of flags and you'd have to go in and put a flag in each organ or each um, gland where it was in the body after it was all splayed out like that. That was craziness. I took A and P in the summer so that it was a shorter class. It wouldn't be drawn out from like January all the way through May. <laughs> I didn't want to do that long. So I did A and P one in June and then I did A and P in July. That meant I had to go to school every day. It was Monday through Thursday every day for like four hours a day. But I got it all done in four weeks and then <laughs> went and took the next one just so I could get it out of the way and not have to do five months of it. I don't think I would have passed if I'd have had to learn everything. I just had to learn enough yep, to get through it the four weeks. And everything you learn in college or whatever school you go to, you throw right out the door as soon as you hit the job, <laughs> no matter what it is. You got to learn everything else again. This one helps with digestion. I went to Northeast Mississippi Community College was my first college. Long time ago. I was working in a shirt factory making Disney shirts. I did it, I don't know, maybe nine months and walked out one day and went that day and enrolled in college and then found a night job working at Billy Joe's Barbecue <laughs> nights and weekends so that I could just go to college full time and then work nights. So thanks to Billy, Billy Joe and his barbecue place, I got to finish college or actually do college. Just got me started with the associates. Helps. I became like a daughter to that old man, Mr. Billy Joe. He ended up getting me a college class ring when I graduated, but he paired up with my grandfather, my dad's dad at the time, and they split the cost in half and bought me a class ring. That was so sweet of him. He was a mean old man, but I turned him around. <laughs> and I was the only one that he let mess with the grill. Nobody else got to cook on the grill but me, so that was great. And he let me bring my kid to school to work every so often if it needed it. So that was awesome. The only way I made it through. All right. Let me grab these. Let me see if my, I hope my laptop is charged. I forgot to charge it. I'll bring this sucker down and we can get started on some practice exam questions. Oh, did I lock you in, Miss Magpie? <laughs> Thank you for the follows, guys. I'm real happy to give y'all tips. Absolutely. Aw. All right. So we'll keep working on that endocrine system. I got to finish up the pituitary. And then I'll add some facts in, probably relatable to a radiology and endocrine, but we'll need to get some more notes in here about radiology. We need to, um, there was one of those questions I did last night about what is the ISP, what was that? There was a question about the same side of the body. And I was looking around to see, usually AAPC doesn't ask a question unless it's in this book somewhere. 
So I wanted to see if I could find it. And so, of course, I came over here and wrote it right here, meaning same side, because I knew we had distal, lateral, we had the posterior aspect and anterior aspect. I added in trunk and trunk because that's what they use in the CPT code descriptor. But anterior means chest, posterior means your back. But then when I flipped it over, I ended up finding our vocabulary word from yesterday in our workshop right there that IPSI, which means same, and then our other word that was attached to it was IPSI lateral. Lateral was the second part of the word. They just combined them and made that our vocabulary term for yesterday. And it's right here. So same side, you just put them together. So just knowing that when you're taking the exam, even when they give you crazy stuff to define or something you may not know right off the top of your head, if you can't find it in the back of the book in the alphabetical indexing and find a CPT code related to it, because this wasn't a procedure name, you know, they weren't doing anything that might be related to a, a CPT code. They actually do have an anatomical review up here with some numbers and surgery procedures and suffixes and prefixes. Don't, yeah, that's the word. However you say it, I'm not even going to attempt to say it, but it is actually up here. So that's kind of cool. It is in the front of your book. If you knew where some of these prefixes and stuff were, you might be able to figure it out. If you had no clue, everybody knew it seemed like that it was on the same side. So that's cool. The other thing I did after yesterday's workshop is in the back where I had added some of those different abbreviations. Remember when we had that one about the doctor would use which procedure to help a person with burns? Everybody pretty much guessed the total burn surface area one when the answer was full thickness skin grafts. Um, but I noticed that full thickness skin grafts wasn't back here in our little abbreviation. So I added that one and our ICE, I-C-C-E wasn't here. We know that one's with the eyes, but it wasn't here either. So I went on and added those just in case. Don't forget also while you're up here for your exam to, let's see, where is it at? Don't forget about your little page up here somewhere. This one right here. They might ask you a question about when a CPT code might be released or might become effective. And they might use AKA terms for those and they're pretty specific, but there's a difference between those dates. So it's all listed here. We even have hit picks listed here and stuff like that. So just remember that that thing's here before you don't forget about that. And of course, our place of service, one little page is up here. Um, on the exam recently has been tribal land and group homes for your place of service. Wherever you're providing medical care, you do need to add a number to a claim to say where you're at. And that's what this one piece of paper is for. It's the first piece of paper in your CPT book. And then our little cheat sheet for the um, modifiers. I did add the GA for ABN and then the lab, the QW for the CLIA waiver. But that's it. Let's put the book aside and let y'all code a little bit of lab. What else did I get? E and M always. Um, path meds radiology. I'm gonna do some more. Uh, this Sunday I'm doing a free workshop because it's my birthday month. And oh, I got I got a gift in today already. Um, for the 
I like Star Wars. I always have, you know, being a child of the 70s, I like Star Wars. So um, I got the um, Lego Star Wars Switch game that's fixing to come out. It does all the characters from the beginning of Star Wars all the way to the Mandalorian in every series. And it's being mailed tomorrow. But because I pre-ordered it, they sent me a pre-order gift today, which was so cool because I got Luke Skywalker and his blue milk Lego dude. <laughs> so I'm tickled by the little things. We got blue milk, but since it is my birthday month, I'm doing a workshop this Sunday on YouTube, which apparently has a really good camera view even with the same camera that i'm using now it has a much better view and clearer screen and i'll do my live straight from there and it'll be free but we're going to do lab path e and m radiology and cardiology and it'll stream live on youtube on sunday same time two o'clock Till five o'clock my time Arizona time Florida will be starting at five o'clock and then it'll automatically save it as soon as I finish and then it'll be there forever for you guys to view whenever you want to so <laughs> and that way it's free it's my gift for you guys for hanging in there and it's also a year ago this month is when I made my first TikToks about how I felt it was unfair that y'all need some more guidance in what to expect on the exam versus what's on the course. And it just sort of started from there. So it's also two things, a year since I've been tutoring and helping people. And it is my birthday month. <laughs> so happy, happy, happy to help. Oh, no worries. No worries. Whoops. No, I don't want to end the live now. I just want to go back to the stream. Okay, there we go. <laughs> yep. Happy anniversary for everybody. And my birthday month. So don't forget this Sunday, but it will be on YouTube. So even if you can't come, you can join in. No, no, no. Y'all are cool. And I'm happy to help. Just remember, if you're taking the exam this month, it is my birthday month. So you got to really, really try to pass. <laughs> not that y'all are already <laughs> not really, really trying. Lots new on Facebook was asking for help wanting to go into a coding program. Yeah, I like the self-study route. I just don't see any courses out there right now that I think are worth. Well, I mean, if you want to learn coding, the old-fashioned way where you index and look through things in the book. Now, today, when you work in a job and you go find a job, they're not even going to have a book in the office. You won't see a CPT book or a ICD-10 book. It's all on the computer. And you will just be Google searching, basically, in the EHR system for the correct codes. And it'll bring up your descriptions. Um, no one codes that way anymore. So I would like to see a more modern course that would prepare you for a job, at least. Um, and what happens in the courses doesn't prepare you for that exam. It was when it was 150 questions and it was five and a half hours long, it was just horrifyingly awful. I think it's a little bit better now, but still, it's still going to be challenging under three minutes per question. Even if you were coding in a practice, that ratio isn't what they would be expecting out of you in a clinic at all. So. The test is 100 questions now. If you take it online, it's 50 questions in two hours on one day, if you wanted to schedule it that way, and then 50 questions for two hours on the next day, which I think is great, lovely. Or you can buy um, it in person, and you get two tries. 
And then it's four hours in person, all at one time. And either way is just fine. I think the exam was a little bit more wordier. The questions were wordier when they printed the book and had you test out of the book in person. I think the exam questions online seemed to be more straightforward and smaller because they needed to get the answers and exam question all on one page, screenshot, you know, thing. So, but that was my impression years ago, as soon as they started, like 2018, 19, somewhere around there, as soon as they started online. So I don't, I don't technically know what it is today other than people's impressions and things that they tell me. Yep. It's a hundred question, four hours long. But anytime you can always send them to our discord group for answers and help. It's hundred percent free. All I got to do is download the app. And then we have tons of practice rooms in there for CCS people, CCO, auditor, you name it. We've got rooms just for the CPT book. We've got rooms for just ICD-10 help, um, job placement, C, um, continuing education help, um, off topic stuff, whatever. <laughs> Betty, you're so funny. She's going live, going live. Where do you find these things? Those are so cute. I can't ever seem to find anything other than those smiley faces. I don't know how to do anything else than what's there. Y'all are so creative. But our little practice rooms here on Discord are great. What to expect on day, uh, e &M resources, HIPPIX resources, compliance and regulatory, all kinds of stuff. If you want to sell your books and you're done with coding, whatever. <laughs> Who have we helped? You get to see everybody who's passed, and they let me know. I post their little notifications in there, every little thing. So, love it. Love our little Discord. <laughs> TikTok doesn't alert me. It should, especially if you're following me. It's supposed to. Oh, i show you one thing it's supposed to do. Oh, my Lord. Where is your... Come on, you can focus. I promise you can. Promise you can. Oh my gosh. Um, on Tiki Talk. So when you open up that, it starts you off on your For You page. You have to hit the following page to find your live people. So I don't know if that makes a difference, but that's how I find people that I'm following. Eat, sleep, Disney. Those kind of people. I like watching people walk through the Disney parks. Those are kind of cool. He has a Disney. He walks the Disney parks. So do they. That's who I watch. They're just rattling on all day long while they're um, walking through the parks and showing you the sights. Those are always kind of fun. Especially if you just want to hear noise in the background. But I don't know if TikTok actually alerts you that I'm on or you have to go hit that button and to see who you're following at any point in time to say that they're and then see their bubble is up there to say that they're live and then click on their bubble. That's all I know on the bottom. Oh, yeah, I guess you could. I don't know. I don't know how to do that. Let's see. I don't know if there'd be anything down at the bottom for me. To, to follow myself, but I don't know. Oh, woohoo! That's a lot of likes for one little old video. I need to post more on TikTok for sure. I do have a link tree there that's got the website, the Discord, all that stuff. If you ever need to find me or want to see where the content is. So for this question, let's get started since it's already almost seven o'clock here. So it's what, 10 o'clock in Florida? Geez, Pete, I'm really late tonight. 99244 is what kind of code? I know this one is established. 
and I know this one's established, right? Any times it's E and M, I like to look. That's a consult. And then this one is a procedure. All right, how would we code this one? What are we going to code the squirrels and turtles? What's it say I got already? Forty-eight on, woohoo! It's a good crowd. Anybody got any decisions on how you would code this one? Are we? Hey, dirty red. What does your last sentence say? <laughs> what does your last sentence say? How would you report what a procedure? It's not asking you for an E&M, guys. Mm-hmm. It's asking you for only a procedure. So C would be your answer. Don't assume. Always check the differences between your CPT codes. And then before you look through one word of your question, don't forget to look down at the bottom of your question to see exactly what are they asking me to code. That'll save you a lot of headache and keep you from getting the wrong answer to. <laughs> they do be, they do. But, you know, the process of elimination will work, you know, 90% of the time, 99% of the time. And you would normally go here and then, you know, you, you can't do two E and M's without what modifier? 25, right? So, you know that one wouldn't be right. This one might be right, but why would you have the 59 at the end of just one procedure? If you're going to do two procedures of two separate identifiable, like I have to put down the instruments and pick up something else, maybe you might add that if you had a different procedure. But anyway, if you think about what you're coding, um, irregularities might be too. You could also see that both of those really don't make a lot of sense because of the modifiers. I mean, do you put the 57 in the first E and M code? It's just kind of weird, weirdness right here. Right, Terry, it is the right or left. Yep. Some procedures are unilateral, and you'll need to add which side you did. Some of them are bilateral. Some of them, it doesn't matter if they're unilateral or bilateral. It includes both. Letting out a cap. Travis, you can go to your room, baby. I can't have you sitting here doing this. And you turn it off as soon as I walk into the room. It's very bad. No, put on something now and leave it there and let go of the remote and go throw those towels. Put on something and leave it on. There you go. Now go fold the rest of those towels and don't change it. Whew. I had to go check on Travis since I was letting out the cat. He just loves it when I do the live so he can go watch what he's not supposed to be watching. All right. So don't forget that one key thing. They are known to do nefarious things like that and have y'all looking around for a ton of crap when you didn't even need to look at a lot of crap. You needed to just pick the one for the procedure code and that's it. 
All right. So we know A is a new patient, right? We know C is an established patient. If you don't have those basics down yet, be sure and learn your differences between your new patients and established patients all the way up from 99202 to 99215. Just those codes at least. That's all you need to do is sort of remember which one of those are new, which ones are established. That will help you out with the exam 100%. I don't like how to memorize a lot because it is an open book test, but at least knowing that would help you. Now, of course, I don't know what the 99394 is, so I got to go look that one up, but I bet it's established too, is it? Okay, Betty's. Betty's on it. So we've got established wellness exam. So we've got to just look at our question only to find the information that we need to know to eliminate at least two of the answers. Let's do that first because it will help us get down to just a 50-50 shot. Also, we can look for coding irregularities. Would we code that code with this code since they're both E&M visits without a modifier? Probably not. Let's look at our question. Look at our bottom. Make sure they really want us to cook, to do a service. Yep, they want us to bill for the doctor service today. So we are doing the e &M. So is Brandon new or established? Yeah, he saw patient six months ago for a physical so we know he's established we can get rid of those new patients and we know we wouldn't bill a physical with an office visit without a modifier so the only answer it could be for whatever's going on in that question who cares we know it can only be this answer and then I would move on to my next question done this one in a live before. This one's an interesting one. It makes you think. Think about your components for the 99214. What do you need for 99214? You need an established patient. You need one acute or one chronic condition um, or a review of meds, right? There's time involved, and there's MDM. So thinking about what you need, what did you not get out of this note? How long is our 99214? 45 or something, 43, I don't know how many minutes it is. Our 214 is, oh, only 30 to 39 minutes. The doctor only documented the counseling time, which was 15. It should have said the total time for the visit. That is what we're missing. Yep, so sometimes they put these questions in a little bit different order where, like, during the practice exam questions, they'll ask, what is PHI, A, B, C, or D? But the exam question will ask it in reverse, like which one of these is not PHI, A, B, C, or D? So they write them a little different sometimes, a little we weird, interesting, very different -ish compared to what the practice exam questions are. So that's a good example of what kind of stuff you might turn into or C during the exam. What is our 99223? 
When it's E and M, I just look them all up. I don't worry about my process of elimination. I just go on and figure out what we're, which each code is. So our 99223. Observation. Two, two, three. This one's initial hospital, right? Initial hospital. Two, two, three. I think, yes. Two, two, one is also initial hospital. Forty five. Is office consult. And 55 is inpatient consult. So let's figure out if our patient, yep, is in the hospital or what we're doing. We got something wrong with the liver. Medical decision making is complex. So it does seem like they want us to do an office visit. We got a comprehensive exam, high complexity on our MDM. Where's our history? Our history is comprehensive. So we're going to be at one of the higher levels. Because the consultation was just on the interpretation of a procedure-ish. It's just of the second opinion on the abnormal areas of a liver. They don't get a consult for that. It's not like the doctor needed to have a consult for a decision for surgery. Um, this is just, hey, Charlie, come look at these films. What do you think? You think that needs surgery? Yeah, that needs surgery. That kind of thing. And they don't get a billable service for that. So we're just going to bill for the patient's office or hospital stay for that day. And because we are comp comp high, we are at our 223. Y'all are right. 223. Yep. That is our three of three of our initial hospital care, and they are at the highest level, 223. A lot of people ask what my notes mean here, where I put above this CPT code 99223. I would have CCH above it. Well, that just means my history is comprehensive, my exam is comprehensive, and my MDM is high. Yeah. That wording. I hope everything goes well tomorrow and is easier than it really should be for tomorrow for you, Betty. I hope it's just a wonderful day as best as it can be for sure. I hope tomorrow's a great day. All right. What is 99468? Nine nine four 
nope, 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 six, eight, six, eight. is our initial neonate, right? Our 71 is our initial peds. Don't start that, Travis. He sneezed. It's just something I say every time they sneeze, don't start. <laughs> uh-uh. Our 60 is birthing center. And 91 is critical care. So we have a 20 day old. Where would our 20 day old go? Definitely not go into critical care. Not in the birthing center. They didn't get born and stay in there for 20 days. They're not considered peds until they are of what age? Twenty eight days. So they have to be older than twenty eight days. And this one is twenty days, so we're good to pick A again. Mm -hmm. All right, finally to lab and path. Hey Mickey. All right, lab and path. Let's get back here to the back of this CPT book. It's really good to try to practice looking up all these CPT codes too because they are out of sequence. And if you don't know where they're at, it could be super challenging. Plus, if they're out of sequence or the ones that are put in way of some of the codes are put in different places where they shouldn't be, and that pushes out the ones that are not out of sequence, out of sequence because these other codes are all up in the way. So it's it's a very challenging section for sure. Looks like we need to know if we are in the 805 area or if we're in the 883 area. 883. If you start looking in that section at one of your headers, versus your 805, it'll help you determine what you can get rid of and what you can keep. I'm still turning. Both these two codes are very challenging to find. Oop, there we go. Go pathology. They do have a neat little element of decision making for these. The 803, 80503 looks a lot like your E and M decision making stuff, but we're in the path and pathology section for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, These, I like the, on page 614 too, um, we've got these elements of decision making for these, which are pretty cool. Because they do look a lot like E and M. Mm -hmm. So we have a craniotomy. 
They want to know, the bottom, what codes would be in the pathology report. Because our favorite craniotomy code is our 07. Mm -hmm. This one will do like plaque from our arteries and stuff. But this one is always the craniotomy one. I love that code every time I see it. But these little boogers, the 80503 and the 80505, this in the book looks so much like an E&M visit. And they even have an MDM decision-making strategy going on here, too. So it's really cool about these codes and the whole workup they have for all three of them there. Glad we're not in that section for this answer. And I'm glad that we see the craniotomy and that that craniotomy is just screaming out at us because that makes that question a whole lot easier if you know about our trick about the 07 is always our cranio craniotomy question. Yep. All right, what about renal failure? If we're in medicine back here. We need to see if we're going to be in the three fives or the four fives before we read our question. 90935. Homodialysis versus hemodialysis. Yeah, we like this question. Oh, yeah. Let's check and see. Mm-hmm. And they're not going to say either one, are they? They're just going to tell you about the procedure. We can tell that our patient is in the hospital right now, just had a catheter placed. Yep, so the differences are the 45 means that the patient just had the catheter put in and needs to be taught about dialysis. Make sure it's in the proper position. They're going to do their first dialysis right there. They'll do follow-up dialysis three days a week um, outpatient after this point, and that would end up being our 47 afterwards. But for the initial, right after they are got the catheter put in, yep, we're right at the 45. Here's our lovely codes again. We know that we are doing with these codes. This is our craniotomy. This is our resections that are cancer, right? This is our plaque removal. And this is disease identification. So like H. pylori, biopsies that might mean there's a disease process going on. That's what's going on with these codes. We actually have to see the question to see which ones we're going to code. But if you don't have that written down beside each one of those CPT codes, what I just rattled off, that would help you during the exam. So plaque, arteries, biopsies, that's the four. The five is a disease process like H. pylori. Seven is craniotomy. And nine is um, resections, but cancerous resections. Seven can do resections too, but it's usually just not cancerous. Lipomas and stuff. <laughs> I know. Go slower. Go slower. Let me get back there. So, 04, it's biopsies of like arteries plaque that came out of an artery, things that we want to know. Well, we know pretty much what it is, but confirmatory results 
of what it is. O5 is for, we want to check to see if there's Crohn's dis disease in this uh, tissue. If there's H. pylori, which is a lung disease, but it affects the digestion and it gets into the, the digestive tract, even though it comes from the uh, an airborne thing. So it's kind of neat. You have to be on two different antibiotics for that. And it mostly affects the senior citizens. Um, that's in the O5. The 7 is for craniotomies and resections of the small intestines and stuff, but not a cancer in the colon resections, more tumorishy lipomas or things. But um, your craniotomies is included in there. The O9s is like whole leg removals or big cancerous stomach removals, those kinds of things. So if we check out our question, we are in the duodenum. And we have an OMA word. The keyword for 305 would be um, disease process. They're looking for a disease process. Crohn's disease, H. pylori, what disease is causing? Yep, we've got the big scary cancer word, and we are doing a resection. And if you don't know that the duodenum is in the small intestines, that's how you find it. You look for small intestines, and you'll see it in 07 and 09. Under 07, it says it's except for cancerous stuff. And then 09, it says it does the cancers. Radiology. So we got 20, 49, 48, and 58. So for the process of elimination, I like the 49 and the 48. Let's go see what the sevens, thousands have got going on. And that's the section of the book that I'll be prepping up tonight. I've got 30 more pictures to take of another section to post, but um, as soon as I finish that, I'll be working on radiology for our next section, 721. So one of them is with contrast and one of them is, I guess, I'm assuming without. So I like to look at the child code first because it doesn't really matter what the parent code says. All I need to look for is what the child has in it. And if I can exclude that, then I know it's not the child code and it would be just the adult code. So we just need to look for contrast. So it does say without contrast. So then I would just pick the parent code, which is the 48. Yep. That's it. That was easy peasy one. I had to loosen the font on this one. My goodness. All right. We got a 50, a 60. Another 50 and another 50. Okay. Well, that tells me to get rid of that sucker then, right? Now that we have all of our 50s, let's go see what our second code is. We've got 50, 50, 50. Okay. We'll go to our next code. We got 01, 
and a 1 1 and a 1 1 so I would get rid of that one <laughs> that leaves us with just C and D and our differences are another radiology code or just the two that we already have. Thinking about what AAPC would or wouldn't do, do you think we would have three radiology procedures for one patient? Yeah, you can pretty much bet you're going to end up with D because they like to see undercoders and, and they don't really do a lot of overcoating unless you're in immunizations. That sucker gets crazy with the components. <laughs> that you code high. But other than that, I would be cautious about doing three of those. What's our 17045? 17. Sorry, 71045 is a radiological procedure on the chest. What is our 71111? That is a radiological procedure on the chest also. But if you look at its parent code, it also includes the ribs. You have to look at the 10 code, which is above it. So they did an x-ray of the ribs and then they ordered an x-ray of the chest. That one code, the 111, yep, 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 that covers both the chest and the ribs because of the parent code, the 10, that's included in the 11. So they did try to make you pick a rib for this one and a chest for that one, and we just wouldn't do that because it's included in the 10, which is part of the 11. And if any doubt, don't pick three CBT codes, just pick two. <laughs> any doubt at all with AAPC, they don't, they want to make sure, they're trying to trick you and to make you think that you need to code for every little thing because you want to do a good job. But in reality, they're just trying to test you to make sure that you wouldn't overcode too much stuff. So with this one, of course, I like the 15 and 16. Let's go see what those two are about. Is this OB? This is babies. Baby babies. We do an ultrasounds. Everything's an ultrasound over here. So <clears throat> your distinction, your one word differences between these. The 15 is all babies. It'll do no matter how many babies you're doing. That's for all babies, but the 16 is singular baby, so it's per fetus. So if you've got three babies, then you need to code that code three times. So this one will do all three babies, all in the one code, all wrapped up inside it. What they're testing for in 15 is just position and heartbeat. So that's why it includes all babies because um, they're just testing for that. But if they're going to do the baby's arms and leg measurements and the skull, then you're going to bill for each individual baby, which is your 16, because they're going to take measurements on each individual one even though they're kicking and causing a fuss and probably not being still, but you'll need to bill it three different times. You want times to it, but it will be three separate codes individually, and it'll be the same code if she's having twins or whatever. So this one, of course, is pregnant with twins, but they're only doing heart rate and position, 
so it's automatically this code. Plus, we know this is a coding irregularity. We would never times two this if we were doing all the babies for measurements and follow-up. We would do each code for each baby. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. Good job, perfectly. These are all over. 87802. Infection agent. We got staff. What's our 317? It's probably way off since it's the six, right? And then this one is just way off because of the 99. So probably just a difference between those two. I don't know. But the six, it's just crazy, right? I don't know. 87653. And that's also a strep B. What's your differences between these two streps? They want to know if you know the difference. So 80702. Since they're both strep B, one of them is optical with a vision. The other one is an amplified probe. A lot of things with lab and path, you just need to know how the test was collected to be able to pick the right answer. Or how the test is read, like the visual. So let's see, what did the doctor order? We're gonna go down here, da da da, antigen. Which one is the antigen or enzyme immunoassay? That also could help us. Rapid antigen test. We used, it looked like scotch tape, like tape you would just use to tape a box. And you just run that strip of tape and see if they have their um, amniotic fluid ruptured or anything like that. It was really neat. It would change a very distinct color right away. Y'all are saying O2, O2, O2. Y'all are right. A is the answer. We could probably get rid of D, right? And do the five and the six. Seven, six, seven. Hmm, everything's ultrasounds here. We have a limited or an aorta. So we have an aorta or a limited organ. Mm -hmm. This one's abdominal. Doesn't matter. They're all ult ultrasounds, but they're very distinct. One's abdomen, one's just an organ, one's aorta. And if you just look from the bottom up, you just see the one organ and you can move on, which is just B. 
the rest of all this about two years history of this, that, and the other, and the colon resection, that's all. And an oncologist, it's all garbage. All you needed was, what did they ultrasound? That was it, which is down at the bottom. Yep, 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 yep. All right, I'm going to, didn't I have, I wanted to do a few diagnoses. I think somebody was asking about diagnosis codes. Switch books around here. Get this ICD flipped around here. I like the book, well, the one from AAPC because you can tell what your differences are in the codes because of the green. Um, I did that worksheet about the, was it the diabetes or something? I don't remember now. What was it? <laughs> was it diabetes? Oh, you missed which one was the answer. It was, it was just the, the O5, um, because it was just of an organ of the liver. I think I did diabetes, didn't I? I did do diabetes. So I like to move the diagnosis codes, guidelines, where they go with the codes, like with the anemia, cancer, all that kind of stuff. Move it to the codes where they, it benefits the codes. That way I'm not searching all over the place for diagnosis codes and the guidelines up in the front of the book because you're not going to have time to go look for them or to evaluate a diagnosis guideline during an exam. Um, so any tips about what you would code first in an overdose, go to the overdose diagnosis codes and write out scenarios near there to tell you what your guideline is. The top ones I would do is some diabetes scenarios, some pregnancy scenarios, some sepsis scenarios, overdosing, underdosing scenarios, some burn scenarios, and some fractures or injuries where external causes would come up into play. Those are the main areas. Hypertension with CKD will come up on the exam. You're only going to have five questions, so don't spend a lot of time with it, but if you're going to move any guidelines from the front of the book, I would move those particular ones near the codes that it affects. Knowing a little bit about the sections of the codes, where they're at, like I know the C's are for cancer. That's just easy to remember because they start out with the same letter. G, I don't remember off the top of my head. So even if I just went, to the first G I could find and just looked at the sidebar header, the different color right there. What color is it? It's a green one. And then looked at my first thing. What do we do? We're in the nervous system. That helps out just to know where I'm at so that when I do the question search to see if I'm going to be in nervous or if I'm going to be in cancer is my main diagnosis, that'll help me eliminate two answers right away. Yeah, G code is, thanks, MK, nervous system. I was thinking gastro for some reason, but nope, we're nerves. All right. So remember, with diagnosing, they could have HIV, pregnant, and a metastasized cancer all at once. For coding sequencing, most of the time, it is why they are here for today's visit. If that person has all those issues, but today they're at the ER for a twisted ankle, a twisted ankle is going to be their very first diagnosis. Then you'll do any complications to that twisted ankle, and then you'll do their rec regular diseases. 
the pregnancy, the HIV, the hypertension, the diabetes, all that'll come after the ankle. So keep that in mind. Yep, yep, yep. So why is this patient here today? Are they here because of their cancer? That is a malignancy that has metastasized. They're telling you all about that. Or are they here for their nerve issue? Yep, they are here for our nerve issue, so we'll get rid of the cancer ones. The other thing that's helpful is if you know in the cancer sections, your primary cancers come first, and then your secondary metastasized cancers do come next. So later on in the ICD-10 book, the numbers, the higher you are, you're getting into metastasized cancers. Metastasized means they had a primary cancer in one location, and then it drifted to more areas. Um, usually brain starts out and then goes down to the lungs or something like that. But knowing that they're saying that this cancer did metastasize, we could, without even looking in the book, you can tell that this is going to be a primary cancer and this will be secondary cancer. So, yep, I would do the same and pick A at the same time. Because mm -hmm. that's the only differences. And AAPC would be testing you to see if you know which would come first, which is the reason why the visit. And then also to know if you know the difference between primary cancer and metastasized. Very good example of what would be on the exam for sure. Your diabetes, so we need to know if the patient is type 1 or type 2 diabetic. What's your default? If the question does not say that they are type 1 or type 2, but it also says that they are on insulin, but we just don't know if they're type 1 or type 2, what is your default? Yes, perfectly. Type 2 is always your default, even if they're on insulin. There's also some guidelines associated with whether they're on oral medication, injectable in medication, or if they're on both. And I move those guidelines to my diabetes codes. Um, recently and I think that will help out a lot of people too because that was something I didn't even have down in my notes when I took the exam. Here is our patient. So do they have type 1 or type 2? They do have diabetes controlled with insulin but no idea. So we'll get rid of the 10. Then all we have to do is decide, do they have the 610 or the 52? I think I had this one in the example in my notes. You think it's 52? Anybody think it's 610? They have gangrene, and they're recommending cutting off that toe. Everybody with 5-2? Yep, 5 twos. it. Good job. Yep, that was it. When coding a patient who has had primary malignancy of the thyroid that was completely excised a year ago, which statement is true? So we're looking for which one's true. When the cancer is surgically removed, 
with no further treatment provided, there is no evidence of any existing primary malignancy, you're going to code a Z85 code. Or you're going to code when further treatment is provided, there is evidence of an existing metastasis code. You're going to code the Z85 first and then a C code. Any mention of the extension or invasion or metastasized to another site is going to go with the D49. A year ago diagnosis with an outcome of complete removal is never diagnosed again. Yeah, we'll just do our history of. Yep. Y'all couldn't be fooled by the wording on that one. How long have I been on, Tink Twinkle? Time check. <laughs> We've got some 30 more minutes. We've got some um, brain is not working today. I'm overtired. What is our symptoms? There we go. I got it. Symptoms. We've got the R codes and we've got cancer codes. So we've got symptoms, cancer, and history of, right? Or maybe a physical. Depends on some, some of the Z codes can be, they're here for a physical. So that just gives me a general overview of what they might be going on. So right away we've got a history of, right? And she's here for her pap. Her results were slightly abnormal. So today they're going to do a biopsy. A cone biopsy of things with a dilation. So what would be her diagnosis? Would it be her symptoms, the cancer that's back, or history of? We're not going to diagnose her with cancer until we get that biopsy back. So we could diagnose her with symptoms and history of but we can't diagnose her with cancer until we get the biopsy back. So she's definitely going to be C. She just has a, a history of cancer, so we know we're going to do a Z code at the end. Her last pap smear came back slightly abnormal. We don't know what it means. Could be nothing. We're going to do a cone biopsy today and see what that comes back as. That will be symptoms with history of. Yep, we will not diagnose her with cancer until we get a biopsy back. So we have symptoms or diagnoses. They're wanting to know if we know the differences. Can we use them? Can we not use them? We have a productive cough with shortness of breath and a diagnosis of pneumonia. What would we code this patient? Yep, no biopsy report left back from that patient. We're only doing her biopsy today. We have no idea. It was on your ex exam, MK. The pneumonia one or the biopsy one? Correct, Jill. 
we do not code symptoms of pneumonia. We only code pneumonia. So we will only have one diagnosis code. So that helps. So then on, you only need to look up the differences between those two codes. Because we have double pneumonia, we are C. Yep. We have another guideline tied to this one. If a doctor prescribes something and a patient has an allergic reaction, we code it one way with the medication first or the symptoms last, or if you do it yourself, Yep, the adverse effect. Yes, that's a good code. And like I said, I recommend you a whole 100% move those guidelines to these R codes and to the T codes. That way you can pick out your differences. If it's the doctor that did, did it, um, your symptoms go first. If it's you did it to yourself, taking too many mushrooms, drinking too much alcohol, whatever it is, the drug comes first and then the symptoms. So we're going to check out and see if the patient did it to themselves or if the doctor did it. These patients have a slow heartbeat. Demerol is usually something you can't get a hold of and get done to yourself, especially if it comes in the IV form or something. So definitely the physician did it. So we're going to get rid of the guidelines that say if you do it to yourself, we would do the drug first. We're going to keep these two. Then you just need to look up the differences. One of them is like self-harm, and the other one is says the words adverse effect. Yep. We'll definitely pick C again. Which one is true about reporting diabetes? Thank you for the roses. If the type of diabetes is not documented and the medical record default is E11, type 2 diabetes, if the patient uses insulin, type 1 is reported, we know that's wrong. The age is the sole determining factor in type 1? No. When assigning codes in diabetes associated with it, they are not reported as primary? No. That makes no sense either. A is our only one that makes any sense. That was on your practice exam. It's good to know. It's good to know your guidelines. A lot of times they'll ask on the exam which one is false, which is harder to spot for some reason than what is true. I don't know why, but it is. You're always looking for the, the right answer, and looking for a false answer is really hard. Kind of got to get in that mindset. Which one is true in reporting external causes? Yep, default is closed. <laughs> we always look for truth. We do. It's hard to look for something that's wrong. Although, I don't know, it just seems weird. I don't know why. We've got only, should never, do not, 
and we got an if. <laughs> your keyword is morbidity. Chapter 20 of your ICD-10 book cannot have any codes coded from that section as primary. But chapter 19, which is also external causes, it can have one of those codes as a primary code or the first diagnosis code of the day. Even though they're both external cause sections, the morbidity word is the one word differences that makes this just mean that it's only chapter 20. So only chapter 20 is the one re one particular external causes that um, can never be sequenced first as a primary code. D is your answer for that one. Which statement is true about C codes? We've got a never, an only, maybe, and an always. That's what I like to do is look up the words in the questions that make the difference in that question. Whatever it's saying about Z codes, the beginning or the end, is defined by that one adjective in the middle somewhere. And I like to look up those because that gives me more clarity as to the meaning of the entire sentence. Never, only, always are definitive things. Maybe is a maybe. And that's what I like to look up in these questions. You'll notice for sure. Yep, we got C. Maybe, maybe. Maybe, maybe. We got lots of J codes. The differences between the 20 and the 40s could make a difference. We got some Z codes, so probably history of something. Do we have two diagnoses or do we have three? Mm hmm. We're in respiratory. So we look at the bottom. She was diagnosed, or he, whoever, chronic and acute bronchitis. So how many diagnoses do we have? The book prep is more important than the studying at first. Getting your CPT book correct and ready for an open book exam is the first part. Once you get done with that, you need to practice practice exam questions over and over and over again for each chapter. Um, I can do two to three chapters a day and teach those guidelines. In a week, you know, so in, in even my workshops, I do, I try to do one chapter for three hours and that shows you every kind of situation you might run into for each section types of questions you might see. So you really need a month of practicing questions in every single CPT area. E&M is a bear. It could take you two weeks to finally get the hang of that. And then you still got two weeks to go through and learn integumentary, radiology, cancer, cardiology, woo, lab and path, medicine. There's just a lot. It could take you another month to 
really practice those questions and get a feel for knowing what you're going to run into on the exam once your book is prepped. But it could take you, it takes at least 40 hours just to highlight your do nots, your do's, your parentheses, and fix your out of code sequences. That's 40 hours. Then it'll take you another 40 hours, I guess, to do your anatomy and then do the one word difference between each CPT code. So you're talking, yeah, you're talking some time. But once you get the book prepped, you're ready to go to answer those questions. Then you just got to practice those questions. Woo! All right, distracted. She has a history of smoking. So I see three diagnoses. Some of you were saying two. Don't forget about your history of. So I see three. So I would get rid of C and A. And then it would be a difference between those codes. Which one goes first? They want to know, do you know the differences between which one of those would go first? Is it chronic or acute? When they have both. Yep. Oh, that's one of our very, very, very first guidelines in the very front of your book. Some people don't have their guidelines in the front of the book. It could be at the back of the book. It could be not even in your ICD-10 book. It just depends on what version of the book you have. But... I'm looking at my 2022 ICD-10 book, and I'm looking at page G5, the very first pages of this whole big old massive book. Your very first guideline after you get through with all your symbols and stuff is your acute and chronic and it says that the same condition can be described both as acute and chronic on the same visit on the same day if you have separate sub-entries in the alphabetical index at the same indention level. So I'm sure bronchitis, of course, probably has it. But what that means is your very first sentence in your ICD-10 index right there it says that the vertical yellow line appears at the second and fourth indention. So that yellow line means that if acute and chronic are on the same indention line under the same heading, like bronchitis, if it said acute and chronic both in that yellow line, then you could use them on that same day visit. If it's not on the same line, then you can't use it. Um, one of the ones that's easier for me to find in here. I haven't updated this book very much compared to previous years. Not a lot of teachers teach this. I mean, I had coding classes since the 1990s and I never knew this. But thyroiditis has acute and chronic on that same indention line. That means I can code them on the same day for the same thing. But acute always goes first, then chronic. You have an RHIA. Awesome job. The yellow line doesn't tell you whether it's acute or chronic. It just tells you that you can code those two diagnoses for one patient for the same visit on the same day. If chronic is at a different indention level, you can't 
you can't code it on the same patient for the same day. It has to line up exactly like that. Some things are indented in different areas where like that nervous system and bone are on one indention but then spinal is in a different indention. You can't code that nervous system with the spinal on the same visit. You have to be in the same indention level if you're going to code stuff. Yep, yep, yep. That'll just help you in your career too as you, you'll get flags and alerts in your EHR systems it'll say that um, you can't do those on the same visit. Don't forget you've got three indexes in the front of your I-10 book. A lot of people that I tutor don't even know that. You've got your alphabetical index here. Then you've got your index of neoplasms. Then you've got your external causes index. You've got three of them. They're not mixed or they don't change colors. They all seem to be like gray color, but this index is pretty cool because it'll tell you which ones are important or they're actually alphabetized, which is helpful for knowing which ones are your status. So all you got to do is go look up status, the word, spell it, wherever I can find it. I'm under transportation. Where is status? Because sometimes it's hard to tell which words are status or not. Still under transportation. Anyway, that's all under accident. The status. So those are all your places that it happened. And then your status. There's your status codes. There's only just a tiny few of them. Um, but it's hard to know which ones are your status. But I like looking at them up in the alphabetical index because they're all right there. So if they were a civilian, military person, a volunteer, a student, or... That doesn't say Hobby Lobby, does it? No, just working it. No, just doing a hobby. Those are your statuses. Those are neat. Hey, moms, how's it going? Yeah, the CPT book is the very first one I would get. And um, go on and invest in getting a 2022 one. The ICD-10 and the hip picks, you could get a prior year used one. Those are fine, but you don't need those really until closer to your exam time. But you'll need that CPT book to prep a lot before you even um, get started and get ready for practice questions. So, like I'm getting ready for prepping radiology now. So what I do is go to each anatomy picture that's right before each section. This is radiology. This is their radiology picture. I'll look up their picture and just Google endocrine system and then the word func um, function at the end and then write down the functions of all the body parts that are on there. Then I'll go to each code here and if the CPT code description, just the num the the words beside each CPT code that describe it has a parentheses. Then I highlight it. Not every code will have a parentheses, and that's fine. But that's my first pass through. If there's any do nots, I mark those in red, so that it alerts me during the exam if I'm doing a difference between this code and that code, it'll tell me what codes not to use. And I guarantee you on the CPC exam, they're going to have one of the possible answers is that code with one of these as a possible answer. So that if you have it highlighted, you'll remember, don't code those with those. 
And that's my first pass through is to do those two things. The other thing is if any of the codes are red, meaning they're out of sequence, I'll go through and put the page numbers down where they go. There are a lot of codes that are redded out like this and they give you a range of codes of where it could be. You don't have time during the middle of your exam to find those codes, so go find them now and put the page number right before it so that if you get one of these codes, you'll know what page number to go look for it because it's pretty bad to have no idea where they are in the middle of your exam. You don't know where they're at. So it, it takes a while to get all that done for sure. All the little highlighting. If you have codes that start out the same as this says radiological exam, radiological exam. This one says swallow. This one says upper gastric tract. So UGT. Then this one, I would just put swallow because they started out with the same CPT code descriptor in the beginning. You just need to evaluate them and see what your differences are. These two codes both start out with CT. Colon graphy, colon graphy. One's diagnostic, one is screening. Screening goes here, one diagnostic goes right there. That way your one word differences, you don't have to do this during the middle of your exam and evaluate these CPT codes. You've already went through and wrote your one word differences. I think that makes such a big difference during your exam. Because these are the words, the ones that they have in this parentheses that they're picking or that they're doing AKAs of, where this one says high density barium or via something tube. These are the one words that you'll find in the CPC exam question that'll make the difference between picking that code or the double enema over here on the other side. I, I used to on the ICD-10s, but I forgot that they were all here during the middle of the exam. Your exam is just like 99% of it is in the CPT book. So, like, I mean, I wrote a ton of crap on every anatomy thing here in the ICD-10 book. That time could have been better served at learning e and &M. I just didn't have time by the time I finished doing all these pictures in anatomy. I spent so much time here writing up anatomy, not realizing there was only going to be 10 anatomy questions when... Now you guys are only going to have five in anatomy, maybe six. Doing all of this is, isn't going to be worth your time when you could have spent all that time prepping your CPT book better. Yeah, so I don't recommend doing these anymore. I didn't even use it during my exam because I forgot I had done all that. <laughs> I was just so focused in that other book and never did do any of that. I never did once turn to all these guidelines when I wrote all this stuff on all these guidelines up here. No, I had no time to look at any of this mess. None. I just wasted days and days and days here. I should have taken whatever guideline it was and move it to the codes, which would have been way more helpful. Now this was helpful, you know, taking some of the examples out of the questions and writing them down next to the codes. Um, like this was a primary open glaucoma of the right eye. They diagnosed the H40.111. It was a mild stage. That was great. I was right here with that code. 
mild stage matched up and I wrote it right there. That was great. Those were handy dandy. And if I had moved like the burn guideline, like code only, um, your, your coding sequence is third degree first, second degree second, first degree last. Write that near your burn codes. That would have been a whole lot better than what I was doing. It was crazy. Ulcers, look for your stages one through four. Yep, 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 yep. Um, anything that was part of an example with another question, um, like code this one first, then your hypertension, then your L code, which was your pressure ulcer that came after. So they did symptoms, the hypertension, then your pressure ulcer. That was helpful more than anything. Just a few little examples like that. When I did skin tag removals, I did the horn skin tag removal. I did that CPT code with that one. But then I did this diagnosis code and I just wrote that whole example right here next to the diagnoses. That was helpful. But all that time spent doing all that anatomy was just a waste. And so was lighting up all these guidelines like this. That was just a waste. It didn't even help me learn the guidelines. I had to learn the guidelines from the questions. Practice the review questions over and over again. And I realize, oh yeah, that's one of the guidelines. We only code, you know, the fractured ankle, if that's why they're here, because that question says, I'm not going to code the pregnancy first because they're not actually here for the pregnancy. So learning the guidelines from the questions was a lot better than writing all this mess up. That was just a waste of time. I didn't learn nothing but to how what the cost of ink pens was, I think, personally. It was just a lot. I have typed up these guidelines for this year, um, and then they're on half the page. The other page, I did screenshots of what the page looks like inside the book and what it's talking about, and then gave you coding examples that you can move to your codes in the back of the book to help you go through those guidelines. But I wouldn't go through the guidelines and highlight and do all this stuff. I would actually just go to the codes and write your examples back here. I mean, I've got all kinds of codes, especially for OB, um, your burns, any of your external causes, gunshot wounds, and anything like that. Anything that you might not understand the sequencing of it, just go write it in the back of the book near the codes. Super handy dandy. But remember, you only got five anatomy, six anatomy questions at the most. What we've got in CPT for anatomy will be plenty. Plenty. And you know my notes for the CPT have enough anatomy in them to rock anybody's socks off. You're going to be able to find anybody in any, any of your answers. Look at all the... Um, the um, appendix L's. I did the legs, the arms, so much of appendix L for you guys. It's going to be great. You're going to love it. Even the questions that they have, the practice questions, I marked them out. It starts out with the middle cerebral. Then you can follow it all the way back to know how they got that answer. So, yeah, I got you. I got you on the anatomy part. We just need to get those one-word differences underneath all these codes that will help you take that and then do a search through that question to see where you're at and what procedure you're doing. Most of your exam is right here, and that's what you should concentrate on, I think. Just my opinion. Just me's my own opinion, for sure. How am I doing on time? Am I really late? Yep, burns are at 3-2. Oh, she said five minutes. How long ago was that? 
gunshot wounds. I love that one we learned yesterday. 2,000 codes. I can do that one. That one's good. You can get a book from Amazon. Just make sure you get one that is from the AMA. You can get it from AAPC, but I think Amazon's cheaper. Just be careful. Some people say they get bad ones, but I've never had a trouble. I've got a brand new one from Amazon right now. I got yesterday or the day before. Not happy with a few of the sections. I'll probably end up redoing them before the end of the year, but I got this one from Amazon this week. It's just fine. It's just like anything else. And it's only, it's like $10 cheaper than from a, from AAPC, so, plus free shipping, so, anyway. So yeah, some people say they are missing pages. I've never had any trouble, but I usually only get one set, and I do it once a year when I get taxes done. Oh, gosh, I still haven't filed. Today's the fourth. i got to file taxes, y'all. <laughs> I've got them done. I just got to hit the button. I got to hit the button. Um, so I just, when I get the tax return every year, I just go into AAPC and pre-order the next year's uh, books from them every year. So I can do that, but I still haven't done my taxes. I know I got to do them. I'm going to get a refund too. I've just... <sighs> transmit button gotta hit the transmit button my um boys had um um there were private adoptions um not foster children or anything but private adoptions and i get credit for the adoption fees and stuff from those kids e eons years later it just carries over like Travis was super expensive, over like ten grand to adopt him. James was the cheap one. Arizona doesn't charge to adopt kids privately um, as much as California did. Cali was ten grand just to adopt any kid privately. It's crazy, but um, I got carryovers for multiple years on Travis that I always have to wait for the form. I fill out the taxes, but then. Every year they renew it, and then they have that carryover form I have to wait on. And then I have to remember to go back in now that they got the carryover form ready and submit. You don't get any cash back for it. It just is just a carryover or whatever, but that's always handy-dandy. Yeah, Arizona only charges $500 to adopt a kid. They were easy peasy. That's crazy. And I don't like a lot of things in Arizona compared to Cali. I liked a lot of Cali stuff. It's have more services and things, but boy, they sure do charge for adopting kids. My goodness. <laughs> the barium enema was on the exam, I think. Radiopath and took a lot of time to figure out. If you do more prep for E&M, because up to 16 questions of your exam could be in E&M, you focus really hard on E&M, and you know how to code any consultation that comes in. You know how to code any, any kind of E&M level visit, any kind of hospital stay, and any kind of critical care patient, and any kind of nursing home patient. No matter what the question says, you know how to code them. You get all 16 of those right, then you can make up for the differences in some of the lab and path that is super difficult to learn and would take you longer to learn than what the E&M is. Remember, all these sections only have six questions in them now. So an E&M has more questions. So... Try to stick to our strong points. Everybody that is tutored with me is getting the 100% on the e &M when they pass and their coding guidelines, which are tied to their e &M questions. 
Um, so just just keep going with the questions that I'm sharing and helping out and learning the E&M from my uh, repeat lives. Definitely am doing something right for a lot of people getting 100% in the E&M section. So listen and carry me with you on your shoulder. Think about the things that I said in the lives. Don't look at the question. Don't read the question. Go to the answers first. Look for similarities. Look for coding irregularities. In Antigmatary, higher numbers go first. Lower numbers in the back. You can eliminate a lot of answers that way. We don't times two a lot of things. There's just a lot of things you can exclude right away for looking for the coding irregularities that will help you get down to a 50-50 shot. Then you can think about, well, do we code four codes or are we coding two codes? A lot of things are about counting to figure out where you're at and what's going on can help you out. And then if you've got your one word differences highlighted or written in underneath your codes, then you're going to do great because you can just search the question for those one word differences or an AKA term about those and you'll be golden. I hope it's my intention. At least you're going to be better prepared than you would have been if you took a course and you were on your own and that was it. At least I can make some sense and and prepare you in some way of what you're expecting to see because there's no way to prepare for that exam or know what you're going to run into unless you've heard of me or seen a live because you wouldn't know what the exam questions are and how fast-paced it is. We'll have to do another one of those lives. I got one of the lives where we went through one of the questions sets, the practice exams, all 50 questions in the two-hour live. So it was in the same pace as the current exam is right now. Um, two minutes per question. We went through each one, flying through the CPT book or the ICD-10 book or the hip picks, just like it was on an exam. We got a couple wrong because I didn't even answer one of them. And then another one, I can't remember. We picked the wrong one. I didn't look up a code. I let y'all pick the code, and we just moved on. And um, But we still got, you know, 95% of them correct. So that was great. That was fun. I'll have to do another one of those. Real-time thing where we could just randomly get our questions popped at us and we got to answer it and then we get graded at the end it wears me out though that's that's a hard two hours but it'll at least you know show you what to expect but i do have one of those lives out there if you want to go look at it so you'll know what to expect <laughs> yeah yeah i like that idea yeah, you know, it's been a while. I have to do another one. You took the workshop and it was great. I'm doing another one. Thank you, Twinkle. This Sunday, completely free. And it's going to be on YouTube, three and a half hours. We're going to do lab and path, radiology, E&M, and some cardiology. And we're just going to do back-to-back -back questions for three hours, maybe probably three and a half, and we'll just keep going. And I'll tell you and show you what's in my head. What would I be doing with that question if I had it during the exam? What would be my thought process? How would I do the process of elimination? You see here I'm highlighting unilateral, bilateral, so the next time I come through this book... I will be marking a big B underneath the bilateral. I'll mark a, a big U underneath this one. That helps so much just to know if we're unilateral or bilateral on some of these things. It's half the battle.
It's going to be 2 p.m. Arizona time zone on YouTube, just a straight live. The video quality is a lot better there. Even though I'm using the same camera, you get a wide angle view of some sort because they make me turn the camera around. And then um, I, the video quality is just so much better. I don't know why. Full screen view or something or another instead of all minuscule like here on Tiki Talk. We'll do just as many questions as we can in three hours. It's probably around 60 questions. I don't have that one posted yet, the um, Intigmatary. I can post a um, thing up in the store that if you want to buy the replay for Intigmatary, you can still buy it at the $10 price, and then you get the log on and password for it. I just haven't posted anything since last night. I will definitely get on that. Mm, separate procedure. I don't need to know. And then I've got to get cardiology posted. I just got to take 60 more pictures. <laughs> I got 60 of it done. I got to do another 60. And then that will be posted. It's so good with Appendix L. Oh my gosh. It is just rocking. It's a good section. I spent my time on that. It took me, what, two months? I don't know. It took me a long time. I got some good notes on it, though. These unlisted procedures, unlisted, unlisted, I probably shouldn't even be worried about these. They're not going to use these on the exam. Anything that says unlisted, they're not going to use them. The workshop from last night is on Zoom. Ooh, I could sit here all night highlighting. <laughs> I could so sit here, but I guess I gotta go see. Say hello to my mom. See if she's still in the house. Say hello to her. I haven't seen her all day. See if she came in. And Travis and James are being like extremely quiet. So I know Travis is probably on YouTube or something, something he's not supposed to be on because he's not in here bugging me. I should be in here writing his Tom Sawyer story. I still got to finish that sucker. But once I got a highlighter in my hand, it's like I can't stop. It's time to keep going, time to keep going. Parathyroid. Lots of people get those ultrasound and everything all year. Tons, 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 tons. That's funny. A water bath. What do you mean a water bath? That's funny. Don't forget, you've got a list of all of your different ultrasounds right there on page 548. A mode, M mode. B scan and real time scan. Those are all the differences in your ultrasounds. But then the header is not here. It should be here, but it's not. You need to put ultrasounds right there, big and bold, so you know these are your different types of ultrasounds. And that's been a question too. Which one of these types is not an ultrasound? So you just go to this list. And if something's listed that is not on this list, then you know that's the answer they're looking for. Me too. I'm going to go too. All right, guys. I'll be back later with some radiology book prep. But thanks, guys. Thank you so much, Twinkle. I will see y'all again Wednesday night for another... Um, practice. It'll be another two hours of practice exam questions and advice. So I will see y'all. Yep, yep, yep. 
that Appendix L rocks. It's awesome. We only have one question on the CPC exam, and I did a lot of work for that one question, but dang, it's pretty. I've never seen anybody work those up yet, so that's pretty cool. I think that'll be really nice to have that done for the exam for your one question. <laughs> anyway, I'll see y'all Wednesday night too, okay? Thank you for the likes and the shares. We got almost 4,000 and a share. Y'all are awesome.